I'm Natasha, and I'm Red. And together we are Syllogism, a science, culture, and philosophy challenge podcast on the edge of chaos. This week's challenge was to read the Unabomber Manifesto by Ted Kaczynski. This was published in the New York Times, May 26, 1996. For a full audio recording, check out our YouTube channel. Enjoy! <laughs> Don't be recording me. I'm in blackface. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Hold on. Hold on. We are the you duo know, bombers. We're, 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 we're duo bomber-esque. So, um, you know, if you happen to watch um, the Scream movies, you'll know that there's always two killers. There's got to be two killers. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I mean. We, we, we. <laughs> We can't possibly allow people to use uh, more advanced technology to create more weapons to mutually destroy each other. Um, so I sent you an audiobook of someone reading it uh, because I'm I think our own. I'm going to do my own. Uh huh. Well, well, yeah. I, you you do your own, and I will actually act out some of the stuff in the background. So I, th- I think I think a hybrid approach is going to. Yeah, but the difference is, I'll actually do it. Wait a second. What is it that you're recriming to? I'm just saying, I will actually do it. (laughs) What will you? This is where 99% of the population fall down. They just don't do it. Quite frankly, that's why 99% of the population achieves virtually nothing. It's because they simply don't do. Most of y'all motherfuckers are puppets. You just, it's about execution. And that's one thing you can say about old Ted K. (laughs) Well, he definitely did execute. (laughs) Well, (laughs) the problem is that his entire philosophy was flawed from start to finish. Okay, I really so I think, think I think you I think you and I will argue uh, extensively about this. Uh, sure. However, he copied all that logic from someone else. All the logic that makes most sense is not his thinking. So his primary thinking is that the industrial revolution is where it all went wrong. It's where nature diverged, and this is something I disagree with. I think that technology and whatever may come of it, whatever sh- downstream of basically stone tools, is part of nature itself. You can't escape the eventuality of technology. So he wants to return to nature, but technology, in a sense, is is a natural consequence. I agree with you um, to a point. I used to have an argument with a a friend of mine many years ago about the difference between uh, what is natural and what is uh, factitious, a word not often used, but uh, you, th- there's a difference between what a- arises out of nature without the intervention of human intellect and what the human intellect itself produces. He's saying h- humans need to be there. So this is a natural consequence of human intellect. Mm, so I'm not so sure. And I, I think you and I touched on this uh, a, a little bit. I, I don't know what that faces, but I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here. And an example of technology not necessarily following this uh, kind of exponentiation that we see now is the uh, American continent prior to a contact uh, with Europeans. Of the uh, American Indians, you don't see much in the way of developing technology at all for something like 10,000 years. And if you have people living in small scale civilizations, kind of like what he's talking about. And certainly they had their issues. Um, If you don't reach a point of uh, high population density, if you continue to live harmoniously with your natural impulses and uh, survive and procreate and love and defend and worship and so forth, uh, you don't don't necessarily see uh, a de facto Uh, technological advancement, because in 10,000 years, certainly uh, those groups of people could have in isolation developed a technology similar to what you see in Europe. That did not happen. And I would say that the fact that it doesn't contravenes the theory that it is inevitable. I don't think so, because on the same planet, just on a different continent, we've read why the West rules for now and guns, germs and steel. And these these anthropological views would suggest that it is inevitable, that it is a natural consequence depending upon geography or civilization itself. So I don't know. I I disagree with you. I think it is one possible 
consequence downstream because otherwise you wouldn't see any civilizations long enough in the realm of history in order to do anything because they would be wiped out by extinction level events, just like the dinosaurs. So if you're going to see any society brought to any kind of length, then you're going to, then it's going to have to be through technology. Otherwise they get wiped out. And maybe that's what Ted's saying is we should, if we're, if an asteroid comes, we should just wipe, let it wipe us out. <laughs> I, I think he would be very happy with that. However, there are certainly tendencies toward this kind of progression, but it's one of only a number of variables among which are the kinds of harmoniousness and, uh, let's say, minimal advancement seen in uh, uncontacted tribes. And I would say that when you have an instance of something uh, not happening at a very large scale anywhere, it does at least in part say this is not necessarily uh, inevitable. It is a consequence and, and therefore a possibility and therefore a, a natural potential direction. possible. Yes, I agree with you in all those fronts. It is possible but <laughs> the, okay fine so then the second argument to why ted's an idiot anyway i'm making i'm making an explosive hold on <laughs> <laughs> don't, for, don't forget the barometer um, <laughs> I, I love it i got a barometer i got an altimeter an altimeter uh yeah <laughs> so so the second reason why ted's an idiot is because he himself was a leftist how can we trust anything he was saying because he's blaming society in a sense, he's blaming technology for all the world's problems, just like a leftist, as he would describe. There's a cluster of leftists that he identifies, and they are uh, socialists, collectivists, politically correct types. He's very big on this politically correct thing. Uh, I kind of feel the same way. Feminists, gay and disability activists, animal right activists, all kinds of people who are looking to gain power within a collective system. And it's this uh, need for socialization of uh, inferior peoples that drives the tendency to pull together and bring about the kinds of civilizational complexities that support the weaker people. And, and so- point of, point of clarification, not inferior yeah. peoples, people who think they are inferior. Well, well, yes, and, and that is true. So it is people who think they are inferior, but it's also people who gain a sense of uh, empowerment from identifying and then trying to uplift uh, and aggress on the part of people that they believe are inferior. Right. So In this part is also because of a, uh, of a feeling of inferiority within themselves. So he talks about two of these kinds of people. He talks about the generic bourgeoisie version, which is basically- Don't be calling me bougie, by the way. Okay. He talks about this kind of leftist that seeks, always has a, has a social problem with something. First, they want to pick on equal opportunities. I read, when I was reading this, I read this article, I think it was in the Times, saying the NFL has a race problem. And I thought, well, hell yeah, it does. And, and then I read- In what the way? <laughs> <laughs> and they were saying, oh, there's, there, there's, it's like 89% black players, but like 8% black coaches. And so I'm like, oh, you want, they want, the race problem is they want the NFL all black. Okay. All right. Got it. So they it sounds want, to me like the number of coaches actually more directly correlates to the percentage of uh, black, uh, the black population as it relates to the American population. Yes, but. But football, basketball, the, these kinds of things have been enriched for Black people because it's held very highly in their culture. And so this is a very big aspirational thing for them. And maybe they're better. Maybe they're better at it. Who mm. knows? I don't like talking about race right now, though. So I'm going to I'm going to move. The uh, yeah, that. yeah, I have all kinds of interesting uh, uh, commentaries on that. So isn't that we're going to save that for the uh, what is it? The Douglas Murray uh, episode that we are uh, going to have to get to. I'm going to say that Ted took a test and claimed he had 160, 170 IQ. And then when yep. they tested him in a different context, it was more like 130 something. So, yep. you know, people, people are going to make all kinds of excuses for their intelligence or their IQ. So I don't. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait to fight uh, with the 
people who think that there are multiple types of intelligence. Why do you? Oh, well, then fight with oh. me. Then oh, I'm yeah, you and I, you and I are going to fight. So we're going to fight, but it's going to be when we do Douglas Murray. <sighs> Wait a second. Hold on. Wait. I got there. No, I, you can't just. I have, I have a bomb set to go off in your room on my phone right now. <laughs> Seriously, we are going to get banned from YouTube. I can't. I can't wait. So let's talk about over socialization. So he says this happens, leftism happens because people are too concerned with society and what society wants. Socialization is a process of teaching children how to behave in a society, in a group. And so he's saying that over socialization is teaching them to care too much about the collective over the individual. And yep. he says that this disrupts all kinds of manner of thinking, but ultimately it's a consequence of technology because we have reduced ourselves. So we have no real problems anymore. He talks about three types of problems that occur in the world and correct me if I'm wrong. This is his power process. This is I love the power process. But this is his, <laughs> his bloviating. So Nietzsche said something like this. This is about the will to power that all men have. Yeah. And so this is old Teddy's bloviating. I'm going to use that word. A million times. <laughs> I, love, I, I, I love bloviating. It applies in so many. No, you uh, do. <laughs> so he says that there are three types of problems. Super easy. Not even really a problem. Some effort required and then absolutely impossible. And he says that technology basically creates more of the two outer buckets, super easy and unfathomable. And what humans really need to feel good, to feel fulfilled, to satisfy the power process is to be able to solve problems that are in that second difficult but doable bucket. And so since we don't have those problems now with modern society, nobody has to feed themselves, nobody has to clothe themselves, nobody has to fight any damn tigers. We create problems for ourselves, which he calls surrogate activities. I love the idea of uh, surrogacy. <laughs> this is a surrogate activity. This is fun as hell. Yeah, th th this is. And, and, and by the way, it does not leave me feeling uh, unfulfilled uh, in any way. Now, there are aspects of this that I, that I do agree with. And that is um, when we feel in a flow state, let's say, when you hear about people talking about these kinds of things, there really is something about operating at the threshold of something that uh, you are both driven to do with a, with a kind of passion that you almost can't explain and that you almost don't have the capability of doing. Uh, so it's like you're operating at the threshold of what is possible for you. And it's that, it's that work at the threshold that actually uh, increases the potential to continue to escalate the thresholds at which you can operate. Yeah. That's um, where I like to be. Yeah. And that's, and that's where we like to be. That's that. And, and that's, I think fundamental to um, human drives. And I think that there are correlates to this in what we need to do to survive in uh, foraging you know, pre, pre agrarian uh, societies, even that uh, naturally relate to and draw out that, that instinct. And now that we don't have to fight for, well, anything, I'm well clothed, you know, except this. I don't know well clothed. This, this, this this hoodie has been, well, wait a second, this is couture. Okay, this is Kaczynski couture. Um, I'm wearing March for Science for all the <laughs> scientific bloviating. Uh, uh, no, by the way, that automatically gets you uh, sacked, right? Because <laughs> he hated scientists. He was a scientist. Um, he was a, well, he was a mathematician. Same shit. Wait, so Same. we're going to fight about that in a second. So we have all these things that are taken care of for us. We don't have to do anything that is essential to our nature to feed ourselves, to house ourselves. We create artificial environments such that we can live almost anywhere. Basically, we're the first megafaunal extremophiles. So we can live anywhere under any environments precisely because while we have a range of adaptation, we're able to build microcosms for ourselves that allow us to uh, exist where the outside is like, uh, like hell <laughs> in some way. Um, and so I am basically helpless and in lots of ways, powerless with respect to being able to recreate most of the environment that I, that I live in. Yeah. But as an extremophile, as a megafauna extremophile, you wouldn't need it. If everything collapsed, you'd be fine anyways. Right. Well, well I would be only because of technology. There would be some humans that would be able to recreate it. There are humans are not a monolith. We're all different in terms of our use of technology. Granted, 
almost everyone has a cell phone, but, but being here in Tennessee, let me tell you, these motherfuckers going to survive. <laughs> well, like, well those, are still dead. Real pe- those are still closer to being real people. Almost none of us can build a shelter. Whatever, dude. I disagree. This is a kind of a trade-off, right? There are always trade-offs. And this is what our buddy in Civilized to Death says, that there are always trade-offs along the road to progress. That we, we if you look at physicians, for example, you go to any physician, I just went and had an MRI on my knee, and they are going to know all the things about my knee and all the things about my joints. But if I mention anything about a cough or I'm feeling sick, they can't do shit. They're hyper specialized. And so we have yes. lost the general medicine component that we used to have at, at large, but we've gained, look, they could do arthroscopic surgery on my knee. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a trade-off. It's neither good nor bad. It just is, but progress for progress's sake. It, nobody seems to like that. I want to talk about Heidegger and Heidegger is very much against progress for progress's sake. He isn't really against technology himself, not nearly in comparison to Ted, but he is against not understanding what we're doing and pushing forward with technology that just for the sake of technology, just just for the sake of progress. He, He said prior to the Enlightenment, we were all very interested in God and we all lived in the context and our being was centered around God. Our job was to be good constituents. What would you be? Good believer? Uh, probably believers. Good believers. Uh, at a minimum, maybe acolytes. Uh, acolytes, yeah. So uh, we were. Like that. That's what we were supposed to be. That was our. That was what being human was about. And mm-hmm. since the industrial revolution, or before that, the Enlightenment, people have started to move towards progress for progress's sake. So the ultimate goal of society is to optimize. And I find this to be a very scary thing as well. But the one thing Heidegger says, and this is uh, in contradiction to our buddy Ted, is that Mm -hmm. Heidegger uses very poetic language in saying that he believes that the answer and the key to our salvation is in the danger. That going deep into this technology for technology's sake or progress for progress sake is where we find our salvation somehow. Ted didn't think that. Ted said, blow it all up. (laughs) Well, and I, um, so I agree with, uh, with, with Heidegger and I I did want to, um, and I I like, I like this idea that um, it really is about confronting danger. So two things, one is going back to this idea of, uh, of the, the power process and where you need to be to, to function optimally and feel most alive. Um, where is that? Well, there's a danger at that at that threshold. Um, and so solving ever more uh, complex onioned problems that or matryoshkas or whatever you want to want to call them, leading you to ultimate control over everything really is what a species does or what our species does, especially to arrive at uh, safety and conservation of energy and to allow us to do the kinds of creative things. Uh, that like you and I, for instance, are, are doing right now. And so there is um, a, a value in the surrogate activity because the surrogate activity really is something that seems as it's, it's above what's necessary for base survival, but also uh, allows you to explore uh, other avenues of what it means to be human. Ted didn't think those were important. Well, that, that's the part of him that was, um, well, wrong. <laughs> Every fucking episode, you say that. <laughs> I love saying wrong. Somebody's wrong. Freaking like wrong. A, I need. We need like a Trump wrong. wrong. Fake news. So, this, so let's talk about surrogate activities then, because Ted is an asshole and doesn't understand their value. He basically wants to say surrogate activities are just a consequence of not having any real problems, and I disagree. We're ever, we're always trying to improve society. And he, he came for scientists, which pissed me off. He came, he tried to bomb the fuck out of some of us. And he, and I like how I'm identifying all of a sudden with academic science. <laughs> <laughs> scientists aren't curious. They just want to further their career. And I'm like, okay, bitch, what about prior to the technological revolution? What right. about, what about prior to, you know, the 19th century? 
Like pe- they were, people were interested. What about, what about our favorite Francis Bacon? Cause we have to mention bacon in every episode too. <laughs> I, think I think he's full of shit. So, and he, he calls out Dr. Teller for the H bomb and creating nuclear, Oh, nuclear energy. We need it to do what he, he gets mad. He's like, we don't need nuclear energy. We don't need it to power everything. To create more and more power. <laughs> just pinch yourself really hard. You'll be able Dr. To Dr. Teller just, just wanted to be famous. And he, you know, and, and so I call bullshit. The thing is, is that we, we do surrogate activities that we develop over time. And it's a logical pro- progression for him to be interested in a humanitarian problem that he can solve. He says, oh, he wasn't interested in any other humanitarian activities. That's because he probably wasn't very good at poetry or whatever the fuck he was. He worked on what he was good at. So I, well, I take issue with his motives of science. And, and Furthermore, let me keep on my rant. He says, some scientific work has no conceivable relation to the benefit of the human race. This is arguably and demonstrably untrue. There's almost no aspects of science that doesn't affect us by his own definition. We are all parts of the system and therefore we're affected by any change within it. By his own stupid principles of history, he contradicts himself. (laughs) Any change, any discovery, even what did he call uh, comparative linguistics has no real benefit to humanity. The fuck is wrong with him? I, I, I think I can see to a degree where he's coming from, at least in modernity. What began as uh, something that happened usually in isolation as a, a kind of expression of uh, intense curiosity about uh, extraordinarily abstract things has become an over-socialized, systematized machine that that rather than fostering uh, curiosity really is almost a kind of uh, curiosity that is confined by systems. And and so it becomes anti-curiosity. So I think in that way, he's on to something, but I don't think that inherently uh, science is uh, anti-curious. I think that makes zero sense whatsoever. It is only curiosity that leads you to want to explain any phenomenon at all beyond superficial uh, perceptual awareness. I agree. And I think we can't bucket curiosity into this surrogate activity necessarily. It's just a human characteristic. And I think this is a good point to talk about what happened to poor Teddy when he got MK Ultra. I think if he hadn't <laughs> gone through those psychological berations against his theories, because the idea that he was subjected to what the guy's name was Murray too, wasn't it? Da- uh, Murray apparently is uh, the, anytime you see an evil scientist, <laughs> Murray, uh, Murray. Murray is Dr. Murray. So the MK ultra experiment. So this Dr. Murray was participated in, you know, CIA experiments and stuff like that to determine what would break down people's psychological well-being, like, you know, would Hitler commit suicide, this kind of thing. And so after that, he was conducting these unethical experiments at Harvard. And the, the premise of it was, okay, write up all your beliefs and your life philosophy, which by the way, I would love to read. I don't think I've seen that document of what his pre-psycho life philosophy was, but they, they were to submit this to the researchers and the researchers who I believe were lawyers or whatnot would come through and rip their apartment, their apartment. (laughs) (laughs) They would rip their argument to shreds. Have you washed your underwear? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So they they would rip rip their arguments to shreds and Mm. berate them for being stupid fucking morons. And so that had to have an impact on him and what he felt he had to do to get his piece of shit manifesto out there, which had some good ideas, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. If he had, did you see the meme, the meme that came out, which I'm going to post before this episode. And it was like Ted K born in, when was he born? Like 1949 versus Ted K born in 1985. And it was when he was born, when he was, it's, you know, it's the consequence of what it is. And if he had been born in 1985, he might've been on the Joe Rogan podcast. (laughs) (laughs) He might've been talking about Thanks for having me on, Joe. Just thinking about Joe Rogan with that with that meme. Uh, Joe Rogan is uh, nice uh, to to listen to and to converse with in ultimately a kind of safe way. And I think uh, it w- the manifesto itself would not have had the kind of gravitas that comes along with uh, 
what he was trying to do. It's like, this needs to be brought down. Here are my targets and people are going to die. Um, on Joe Rogan, even now, you know, you can be censored for talking about ivermectin. Yeah, but the argument of the meme is not that he would be the same person. The argument of the meme is if he were born in 1985, he wouldn't have been subjected to all this bullshit. He would have had a totally different set of circumstances. In fact, this entire manifesto may have been different and not as intense. And if he had only had that happen, he might have been one of the greatest minds you know, in history. But instead, he's rotting in jail. Okay, so I'm gonna take I'm gonna take uh, issue with this uh, with this approach. I watched a documentary. I think I think you and I mentioned it uh, you know, briefly in, in the background, where um, you could see that some of the recordings showed that some of his ideas about social uh, systems were already uh, in place, perhaps in a kind of uh, you know seedling form when he was a teenager undergoing uh, these experiments. Um, he was uh, as a child. Uh, ill for a time, and he was then isolated from his mother at, at a at a developmental period that surely created um, insecure attachments. He was already uh, unable to make the kinds of attachments that you would see to civilization. So he was hypo civilized, I think, to begin with, both uh, because of what happened with his mother and then because of his. Uh, uh, exceptionally uh, precocious intellect, he attempted suicide. So it seems to me that his the certitude of his sanity with these ideas is so central to him. They want to downplay the potential impact from the level of uh, the government and the potential associations with Murray. And uh, he wants to downplay it. But people looking to discredit the ideas want to say basically he was insane. So yeah. the government wants to protect itself. He wants to protect his own ideas. It's all the people in the middle theorizing about it that want to make it so that these ideas are utterly insane. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I can't wait to see the movie, which this will, this will come out right before the movie airs. So this is going to be very interesting because from what I've seen from the trailers on this movie already, they, they make him look really bad. I mean, he is bad, right? He is a villain. There is no other philosopher in history that I can really think of. Maybe there was one, I'm thinking of one in particular, I can't remember their name, that killed people for their ideas. Regardless of whether or not he is correct about any of these things, most of us would say it would be better to descend into whatever madness we are going to as species than kill people. Because truthfully, a revolution is not going to do any better for us. Think about all the lives that are going to be lost in a in the the fall of technology revolution that he wants. How is that better for humanity? We won't ever be able to really stay in this stasis of non-technological state because one of the possibilities of human development is technology. So we're basically just trying to yeah. tap down entropy again. <laughs> well, he certainly is by introducing a large scale uh, singularity style event uh, in the form of societal collapse, uh, we would temporarily uh, increase entropy in order to then reduce it. Reduce it, right. He does say, however, somewhere in here when he's talking about strategy in which he's uh, basically saying, look, you can use the tools that exist in order to bring it down. In fact, the system itself, I think, is so large and complex that without them, you wouldn't be able to uh, to bring about a, a revolution. In a way, I agree with this. Sometimes you have to work it from the inside. But some things that I do agree with him on, he says, people anxious to rescue freedom without sacrificing the supposed benefits of technology will suggest naive schemes for some new form of society mm -hmm. that would reconcile freedom with technology. So I think of this one time when someone on Instagram sent me this book by Yanis Varoufakis, the Greek prime minister of finance, he wrote a book called Another Now. And it's about essentially about a flat hierarchical system. It just seems very naive. It, the book is not, not my favorite book. Um, I don't know why I feel bad saying that. Like I wanted to keep it. It just wasn't, it just wasn't good. <laughs> it, it's kind of how I feel about crypto. I kind of feel like crypto is basically just a reshuffling of money. And not only that, I also feel like crypto has an eventuality that no one wants to talk about, which is when quantum computing actually reaches a steady state and it's being used, 
crypto will be moot because they can use quantum computing to quickly unravel the cryptographic hashes. So, yeah. I mean, ult ultimately, anything that we think of as secure at any moment becomes insecure by some by some countermeasure. I mean, it's the nature of humans uh, to do a, a kind of spy versus spy thing in which uh, we ever more ratchet up the technologies that uh, both make us better and counter one another. Word. Word them up. <laughs> oh, here comes the hot step up. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh. And, and by the way, I do want to say, Ted had awesome fucking hair. When you see the, the pictures of him, when he's first grabbed by the FBI. His hair is all like. Massive, wild, heavy metal, rock and roll fucking hair. So I just want to say that I totally identify with uh, Ted's hair. Thank Ted you. was kind of foin when he was when he was younger. Not gonna lie, not gonna lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if uh, if, if I leaned in such a way, I would hit that. Oh. <laughs> was that was that was that was that bomb? Is that the bussy? <laughs> bomb ass bussy. Wow, I have I can't believe you'd be gay for Ted. <laughs> Gay shit. Gay shit. This is, you're definitely on the watch list. Not me. Not uh -huh. me. Oh, oh, you know what I meant to say? When I sent you that audiobook, um, I saw people saying, oh, welcome to the FBI's watch list. And I was like, you dumb fucks. You're, everything you're doing is being watched right now. And you don't even need Bill Gates's uh, injection from a uh, wild vaccine and pseudo pandemics and stuff like that to make that happen. But there's levels. There's John McAfee levels. You know what I'm saying? Like John McAfee oh, yeah, was on yeah. the top tier. John McAfee ain't no more. And you know what Ken said to me yesterday? That was so fucking funny. He was like, I was looking at, into McAfee stuff and everybody thinks McAfee's so brilliant. But that motherfucker created more problems than he actually solved with his software. <laughs> that leads us to... <laughs> The Technium. So I, I've, I've talked to, to about this with you a couple of times. There's a book by uh, Kevin Kelly. It's um, What Technology Wants. And he basically almost refers to technology itself as a kind of entity that is uh, kind of self-evolving and reinforcing. And so he'll talk about how no technology is ever really lost. And there might be some small arguments for that. But a lot of things that we have always done, even way back in uh, in prehistory, are still done by people to varying degrees, even with the overlays of technology. And it just continues to kind of build uh, uh, upon itself to the point that humans themselves become part of the technological system such that we are tools. We are you're a tool. We are, we are be, I am a tool, but I'm a tool maker who makes tools that themselves also make tools. And while I'm using those tools, I then make other ones. And so we live in this system of tool making uh, in which humans are both the beneficiaries of, of uh, the, the technium, but they are also a component of the technium yeah. because without yeah. us, there would be no such thing as tool making outside of maybe what crows uh, and, and, and so forth might do. Tool making technology is inescapable because we are ourselves tools. Right. So, and this goes against your entire return to nature, Emersonian, civilized to death, noble savage fallacy. This actually goes against Ted K, all of it. It goes against all of it. If we are in fact tools, then that, that only reinforces my argument that technology is inevitable. So I, I so see this yeah this is a dive computer so I'm I, I'm actually going to uh, you know start making another explosive because you're contradicting me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dive computer on your desk. First of all, <laughs> I have to charge it. <laughs> Are you going diving? So if you ever want to experience what flight is really like, if you want to truly be uh, living in something otherworldly, you you must dive. You I do dive. Dive. Great. Okay. Oh, we got to do an episode where we're just diving and we talking. Hell to each other. yeah. So I really need to build up my argument and understand this anti noble savage argument because I am, I couldn't be more of a futurist, I think, than, than you are a, a naturalist. Uh, an ar anarcho primitivist? Yeah, no, you're an I, anarcho primitivist. I, I'm not an anarcho primitivist. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that. You're close. 
Really? Close. And I'm, I'm almost like an anarcho technologist. Like I would rather see us go into the foundation series than return to caveman land. <laughs> I mean, I'm all about kind of exploring the unexplored and exploring the unknown. We already been there. We already done that. Let's let. And he's he is talking about how oh, the longer we wait, the more painful it's going to be as we crash. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Type shit. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Ted. I don't think he wanted cataclysm. He was very concerned. If you think about why he even started doing this, it's because someone came in and fucked up his life. He they were building a road. In, into his woods or some shit and he got all pissed off and had to go bomb people like how oh, whiny bitchy leftists <laughs> so he's feeling weak he's feeling powerless he doesn't even know where exactly he is that he fits in society and then he's uh, using the power of a kind of a kind of tyranny to present himself as a collective which is what these other groups would normally it, it comes from a sense of of powerlessness, which, by the way, is his basic diagnosis for all of what's wrong with society. It's just that he manifests it himself as well. Not only that, but he uses modern technology to destroy itself. When he sends packages through the mail and mm. says, I can reach out and touch you. And then he's sympathizing with his target saying, it's not your fault, though. Society has done this to you. So he is the essential leftist that he is proclaiming is the problem. Yeah. That, oh, they sympathize with all these powerless groups that they think that's, that a collective or society or whatever has something has done something to them that has caused them to be the way they are. He's yep. the fucking problem. Shut, shut it down. We, that's right, girl. Shut that done. down. <laughs> so I just want to say that um, I think there's a little bit of uh, leftist uh, linguistic permutation going on here with your definitions of what I am. So I just want to counter that uh, and, and say that I am not uh, a devout Kaczynskian. I think we need hybridization. There is an absolute need uh, in, the, in everything in our biology to be connected with the natural world. And it's the degree of disconnectedness uh, that determines whether or not technology itself winds up being helpful or harmful to individual and collective psyches. And so what I advocate for is get out your house, get off your phone, stop watching TV and go and breathe and live and have different smells and challenge your body to do uh, extraordinary things. And then use technology as an adjunct to everything else such that you are not merely, you know, this uh, a, a, a program, a, an, an algorithmic representation of a human being. There's a conciliant idea here of balance. And I think yeah. what's happened is we've gotten out of balance. But, but the one thing he says very definitively is that you cannot design a new society and people are not choosing their society, the future society, rationally. And I think while this is true, we can't entirely predict things because we're human and our minds can't possibly compute all the permutations. We can make an approximation of where we want society to be. And I agree with you, if we don't stay somewhat in the real, we will lose touch with real aspects of humanity and become something other. I think that's not a, an outlandish prediction to make. So the ability to uh, to extrapolate really does have a very finite uh, constraints, and that's both an uh, and that's an effect of short your short term memory span, uh, you know, your ability to to jostle ideas around the complexity of your insights, uh, and and really we are a species, and this is I think this is my primary point with this. We're a species that is so uh, hyper adaptable that as that, that as things change around us and they emerge, we then, we then simply uh, we, uh, adapt and assimilate and, and, and so forth in conjunction with our environment. And this is unplanned and unstructured, except at very maybe you know, rudimentary levels. I agree. And I think he talks about the rapidity of change, in, especially with, tech, with regards to technology. 
and how that further complicates any kind of extrapolation of what society will look like. You know, we thought we'd have flying cars by now. (laughs) 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 Although I have seen recently, I think that uh, there are a couple of companies uh, already looking at uh, flying cars. Oh, for sure. (laughs) So, So talking more about how we can't design a new society, he talks about in the future, how there are a bunch of different possibilities. But the truth is, is that if you look at where we're going with neural networks, you, you have no idea. There's no rationality to understand how neural networks are working. We can train a network to make a prediction, but we have no access to the black box to understanding how it came to that decision. So this is further complicating the evolution of society because we are allowing machines and technology to have more control in a lot of ways. And it's a slow creep that he, he did also think was happening. It's not a, a takeover. It's a slow dependence upon them. And I, and I agree. I think anytime we do that, we're, we're going to be in trouble, but mm-hmm. he also talks about how we're sublimating this drive for power into a specialized task that you know, we're, we can potentially genetically engineer the need for the power process. If you look at the way we are drugging ourselves, there was a lot of like Aldous Huxley vibes going on in this future section for me, where he was saying, we're, we're basically willingly going into our own coffins. And, th- and then we're just allowing society to kind of drug us into submission. And I do agree with that. He also said humans need increasing specialization that what's going to happen is there's going to be two camps. There's going to be the duds in a sense who just do rote tasks. And then there's going to be an extremely intellectual class that's required to keep technology progressing. This is what I call kind of the, the George Jetson phenomenon where mm-hmm. he's just doing his, you know, making sprockets, pressing, pressing his button all day. But I would argue that there is no need for that highly specialized class anymore, even. The, uh, we need that to counter what's happening. And if we, and I think that could be a key to the salvation, but I don't think that's the way we're going. I think we're shutting down free thinking. Look at the no code project. I don't know if you're familiar with no code. It's mm, this tech no. idea that basically nobody will need to code anymore. Almost nobody, because it's like WordPress in a sense, everything is kind of a plugin. So you don't actually, I look, I look at Python. Python is such a simple language. Uh, The syntax of it is so simplified. And so there's fewer and fewer people that actually understand the complexities of anything. And even those people we talk about as academics, those people are out to fucking lunch because they don't even recognize that what they're doing is just promulgating the same shit over and over, not actually making any breakthroughs. Mm. So I do see what he's saying here, but I don't think that's what's happening where we don't have that increasing specialization. We need it, but I don't see that creative thought actually happening right now. Well, something that, that um, occurred to me is so when you're reading something on a screen, when you're uh, doing something like when we're doing our zoom calls and so forth, um, when you're doing work that is uh, almost entirely computerized, it basically shuts down uh, the process of daydreaming. And so I think that this is one of the real interrupters of creativity. This is one thing in front of me and I can't, how can I pull and reach from something else when this is requiring my 100% attention? Yes, but, it, but it's even different with the screen than it is with a book. This might be a temporal thing. Video killed the radio star kind of thing like that. I really think that that might just be it because you're old. You know, I'm old ish. Woman, woman, don't make me throw my teeth at you. But you were raised in a world where, with no cell phones. You know what I mean? And and these kids are have been in front of a screen. So they've adapted to it before they were even fully formed. So this could be a phenomenon that's happening disparately between the generations. Well, that and that would be interesting to explore. So we'll have to find the study, or I'll have to find the study. Yes, find it. And we should we should look at what the groups the, the like groupings it. were. Because what you said was that something that requires your hundred percent attention is going to uh, fuck with your attentional basis. And okay. I agree. But the difference is that the younger generation do, isn't as sucked into this 
as the older generation is. If you look at younger mm-hmm. kids, they'll be doing 80 fucking things at once in 80 different screens. They, they're watching TV on their phone, drawing, listening. You know what I mean? They've got a million things. So I think our attention has been differentiated. And so if you look at the way younger kids process attention, it's going to be probably very different than you or I. If you're not able to do something where you've got some free capacity, then you still have you you still have the same problem, even if you're able to distribute it amongst more among more um, consuming things, if it's really just more screens, all you're really doing is a kind of attention deficit multitasking that really still isn't allowing the mind to I generate agree. novel creative ideas in the absence of stimuli. I agree, but we're we're talking context versus theory. You're saying in that context, that will not create free thought. I agree with that. What I'm saying is mm-hmm. that because they are accustomed to doing this more so than we are, the way that their attention works is different than the way ours works. So they may, you're saying, oh, I don't think it'll ever work where you're looking at a screen versus when you're looking at a book. I don't think we'll ever be able to draw our attention away from the screen like you can from a book. And I'm disagreeing with that because mm-hmm. these kids don't even really open books. They, if they read, they read on the screen. My kid reads articles on the screen at school all the time. She reads books too, but it, I'm saying it's, it, it's different. And I, and I, I feel like we're saying like, they darn rascals kind of like, I don't want to be that. <laughs> like I, Oh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that when it comes to, uh, I, I'm not so much concerned about uh, the generational difference, I think, that, uh, that you are. I, I just think that we're all uh, equally impacted, even if you uh, have been exposed since a younger age. I don't think we're equally we, we impacted don't necessarily at all. You and I sit on a Zoom call all day for work or whatever. I don't. Now you do. But uh, we're, we're interfacing with technology differently than the kids are interfacing with it. So uh, we cannot be equally impacted. There's no possible way. You didn't go to school with computers in your face all the time. There's no way you're right. equally impacted by the developments as someone in a younger generation. So I'll, I'll rest my case. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, you, you, yeah that, 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 that will be put to rest. If you look at um, the book, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, he talks about these people called the Eloy in the very distant future. And I mentioned something about it earlier when it comes to how technology is just kind of feeding you and you have nothing to do. And basically, these people not only become uh, unthinking, leisured uh, creatures, but they also kind of androgenize to the point of uh, effeminacy. And uh, it leads me to uh, some of what's going on with our uh, recent, uh, I can't decide what a gender actually is. Uh, I don't want to necessarily call them advancements in society. They're called envies. The uh, e-boy envies. called envies. But if you look at any kind of depiction of aliens or what people consider a technologically advanced society, in science fiction, they are always androgynous. You don't find like male and female aliens in a lot of these writings because they've outgrown the need for sex. So so how many different uh, parthenogenic species can we talk to that uh, don't know anything at all about twerking? Um, (laughs) Here's here's my um, not so hard thesis. That is that the people who are typically imagining future societies are typically people who are in some way worshiping science and are therefore necessarily effeminate themselves. Um, ah, okay. So I, if I were to write. Because Kaczynski science, agrees with me. I like that. I like that. If I were to write science fiction, I think I would, I would make it an option because, you know, from an anthropocentric standpoint, we've grown kind of fond of differences and in individuality. And so we would want to maintain that potentially some of us would. So in a, in various sects, we may be able to maintain some individuality and therefore repel androgyny. And then in other sects where they prefer more, uh, you know, uniform consistency, they can have that. In that way, taking what you were and then trying to reconstruct yourself as something new or something that hasn't existed before really is a grasp at uh, the power process in which you're trying to take over your identity again from the collective. So perhaps trans people are, in fact, the most authentic and powerful people uh, alive, and we should all aspire to uh, trans identitarianism. Holy shit, that's the first nice thing I've ever heard you say about trans people. Oh, that's not that's not that's not true at all. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Ten-
Kaczynski was trans and you do love Ted Kaczynski. So are you, you want to fuck Ted Kaczynski and all this stuff? Any, like anytime that you identify with someone else, there is definitely a Freudian uh, sexualization that happens. And clearly uh, there, there is a, a, a kind of, you know, I see myself in another. There's a reason that being in something is a metaphor. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> I'm getting out of this. <laughs> so what does Ted want us to do? Let's conclude this shit because Ted says, well, he says basically there are two things that happen with a revolution. One, you destroy the current system and two, you try to create a new system. And he says what he's trying to do, he recognizes in his own principles, he cannot create the new system, but he's like, God damn it, I'm going to destroy it. And so he talks about the way that this needs to happen. He has a strategy. One is to promote social stress. And, mm -hmm. and the way that he wants to do this is to promote an ideology that opposes technology, kind of like what Brett does every day. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> and so he says that there's going to need to be two levels to this revolution, that there's most people are going to be passive and they're not going to like what he has to say because he killed people. And he says that what you need to do is you need to create a core of people who understand the price that must be paid. And these people are largely rational. They claim to be logical thinkers. While emotion is part of it, they want the facts. They don't want to, they want to steer away from any kind of emotionality. And then he says what those people need to do is propagate this ideology into a simplified form to gain speed and traction with the unthinking mob. And so he says, don't lie. But he's like, what you need to do is create social conflict between the power holding elite and the general public. And this is something that I actually agree with him about that. The, but, but I don't want to see the outcome that he wants to see. He says conflict in general is bad. We don't want to just create a bunch of chaos. You want to direct the chaos to the breakdown of the system. And he says, for example, if there's a green party that comes into power too soon, because he's an, he's an environmentalist, let's get it straight, that this could create problems because they will inevitably fail. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the movement regress. And one more thing about environmentalism, Heidegger was an environmentalist as well, but he hated the idea of being an environmentalist when it comes to kind of tourism. Like he didn't want to use the environment as a technology in a sense to, to optimize a way of living. He was like a naturalist, not necessarily a humanist. And so this is kind of similar lines of Kaczynski thinking. What has happened since? So where is the, where is the subsequent Unabomber? Well, where we are reaching the, a boiling where? point. The zeitgeist is pushing a lot of Ted around, to be honest. I mean, look at the fact that we just chose to do this. We just happened upon Ted Kaczynski and now there's a Ted Kaczynski movie. That's not confirmation bias. That's kind of, that's kind of interesting. There's a fuck ton of Ted Kaczynski memes floating around lately, which is super weird. Yeah. But I do think his ideas are being promulgated throughout the culture. Well, I think, I think a reason for that, though, has everything to do with the fact that we were... Uh, forced into confinement and uh, our only way of actually being human and social was the vehicle of technology in the first place. And so we both, we both see it as a way, uh, we, it, it really is double edged. And like he says, you can't separate the good from the bad. Uh, the good is, well, hey, we were able to continue surviving as a species uh, and at an individual level, but we are also more confined. And so work uh, has made it into my home and I can't escape uh, the encroachment of technology and the things that I do to maintain my level of, uh, well, I guess, civilizational right. engagement uh, because it's right here in my living room all the time. And, and then you watch what's happening with censorship and all kinds of other things. And you can automatically see that the, the People who originally said, do no evil, and this is going to be a free and open space, have decided that there are things that you can talk about, that there are ways that you're allowed to talk about them, uh, and that if you should diverge uh, even slightly from those things, 
you can be destroyed technologically, which forces you in a kind, into a kind of extreme isolation like Ted would choose for himself. Uh, but it basically, it destroys your connection to society. So none of us feel like even with the technology that we're constantly circulating in, that we were compelled to because of what happened during uh, the early phases of the pandemic, like we are able to be safely attached to our own civilization in much the same way that he felt like he couldn't be safely attached when he was, you know, rested from the warm and loving care of his own uh, mother. And so maybe there is a kind of uh, Petri dish going on here with technology showing itself for what it really is. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of people that live in fear. Any people who are individuals should be fearful of what's happening because this is an entire homogenization of culture, ideas, what's trying to happen. Everyone's like, oh, it's not censorship. No, it's not censorship what's happening, but it is shutting down the conversation. And we talk about democratizing the internet and it's, it's, it's an oligarchy. So we, we think like, oh, we live in a democracy. I love when people say this. No, we fucking don't. We live in an oligarchy right. where your vote really doesn't fucking count. What counts is the corporations paying money to support whatever candidates they want. And this is much the same. You don't have free speech on the internet anymore. Who has free, who has the freest speech are the people that the corporations deem worthy of speaking, which only reinforces their hold on society at large. Yeah. Well, and even they are not free because they must say only the things that, that are, will propagate uh, their existence. Well, it, it, exactly. So um, to the degree that you live in a, in a narrative and we are a storytelling, a storytelling narrative uh, species, you know, we live in story. Um, now your story is already scripted for you. It's this big. And, Anything it, outside of it is. Yeah. And, question, and, and even questioning, even thinking in the way that you're supposed to learn to think as you go through the uh, unthinking educational system uh, that, that, that we've had for such a long time um, is disallowed. Because should you happen to reach even a marginally different conclusion that says maybe things don't necessarily work the way that you're telling me they do from on high, uh, and this is done by people who don't necessarily understand what it is that they're censoring in the first place to know that they're censoring the right thing. Um, you are not allowed to think Yeah, you're allowed to be, but that's a natural progression. And I think we'll have web why? TV, we'll have natural iterations of this and why people are argue against this so vehemently is because they're, we're extrapolating. Look how free you and I are currently to say this right now, but who knows? <laughs> and we, we joke about we're going to be in jail in 10 years for our ideas and that's what we're extrapolating to. We're not saying we're censored. We're not saying we're destroyed. We're saying the potential for all of that is imminent. And it is happening. We're watching it happen. And then when it happens, people are like, oh, my God. And then those of us who have seen it coming are like, mm, <laughs> yeah, it was about, it's about time. You, you see it coming. Uh, but there, there needs to be a genuinely free countermeasure. You have to fight against things that are bad. So, for example, what's happening, there's a push and a pull right now. And we're seeing this push against uh, what, what people are calling censorship. And that, to me, is, it, is a natural progression. You're going to see where we push forward, we're going to push back. And the people who are being pushed back against are necessary for the next step to start pursuing something new and freer that will then be pushed back and made it into a prison. And then those people, and so on and so forth. If the new and freer people do it correctly, there wouldn't be a need to push back because the new and freer people eh. would also encompass the people who were previously trying to restrain things. I it disagree. Would, it would be that these things would be going on in parallel uh, and the system itself would censor no one. So, so, uh, so is, and to me, that is, is uh, well, that would be the ideal construction, although given uh, the way that we operate, uh, it is unlikely to manifest that way. There's not enough thinking people and people use dirty tactics. So you're talking about people who have integrity versus people who don't. People yeah, who I'm don't. sorry. I, I usually expect the people I interact with to have integrity, but, but, but we all know that. Uh, people don't. And so you can, the, the side with integrity will always be in constant opposition to a side without it and will therefore always lose in the short run. So. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Then it becomes an arms race. 
So we play the long game. <laughs> well, and that's what you need. And, and so, and so that brings me to something else. You know, you sent me some conversation with someone. They were talking about the construction of the z- design of the experiment for uh, for the marshmallow tests and all other things being equal. Uh, Ted Gazinski passes that motherfucker in with flying colors because he did this methodically over the course of the years and waited for results and tried things out. So, so if you pass the marshmallow test, you might be the Unabomber. But you, no, you, you misconstrued, God damn it, Brett. You misconstrued what you was saying. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> what she was saying about the, mar- now I got to have her come on. What she was saying about the marshmallow test is about all behavioral testing, that it's kind of bunk because you can't differentiate. Was the kid just not hungry? Did the kid just have more like self-control naturally? Was the, Does the kid even really like marshmallows? There's so many variables in that behavior that you can't. I, I I think I think I so I have to dis- so we'll have to have your friend on because I completely disagree that these things aren't now there is fluidity with respect to control and it will be you know maybe uh, approximate impre- imprecise uh, and maybe fuzzy logicy but that doesn't mean that you can't control for these variables so you it, can't it, you can't you control can. for a genetic predisposition to distaste that's what you're knowledge. testing though <laughs> you're testing for this genetic t- predisposition that tells you something about you're someone's not. ability. You're testing for a behavior. You're not yeah. testing for a genetic predisposition. So you're wait, testing you for one, a behavior. One was, one was genetic and and one's not. So um so so I'm, I guess I'm I'm lost as to where it is that you're drawing the line because in my mind it doesn't matter whether there's a, a, a genetic thing or a behavioral thing that you're already encountered. If you're unable to manifest levels of control, then you simply fail the test. So you are on an E.O. Wilson short genetic leash vibe right now, because what I'm saying is genetics and behaviors are not the same. You may be genetically predisposed to a multitude of things, and then your behavior is consequent from that. But what I'm saying is there are so many things that you can't control, like the forced swim. T- we got to save this for another podcast. <laughs> costumes got us like wanting to fight each other. No, I, I feel belligerent. I even, so my shirt today is, uh, is the head of a wolf. Cause I, it's known that he was hunting and, uh, and eating wolves. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm all ready, uh, for this. And I, so I think I feel the testosterone rising in me. So yeah, but uh, people would argue that you don't need <laughs> testosterone, that testosterone is toxic masculinity. Ugh. That is a load of blood. Yeah, that, that, Sapolsky, Sapolsky coming soon. Sapolsky coming eventually. Coming- in what fact, what costume, are we doing next? I wouldn't next then also be us watching the film. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I just want to say this I episode. Gotta go some things. I gotta go. <laughs> it's gotta be the bomb. I'm gonna go shy away so nobody knows that it was. Gotta me. go. I gotta go to the post office. I'll be right back. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to participate in the next challenge, watch the movie Ted K and tune in in two weeks for the next episode.